We now turn to God's holy word. We'll sing, we'll read together from the book of Revelation. So we go to the end of the scriptures. We've been working our way through the book of Revelation. This will be the, the last sermon in that s- series. So we're looking at chapter 20 to the end. We, it's too much to read all at once, so we will just read a portion of that. We'll read chapter 21, and I'm re- sorry, chapter 20, beginning at verse 1, and then we'll read to chapter 21, verse 5, and then we'll read portions of 20, chapter 21 and chapter 22. So let's turn to chapter 20 of Revelation, the beginning of verse 1, where we read God's Word. John is seeing a vision from the Lord, and he says, And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss, and holding in his hand a great chain. He sees the dragon of that ancient serpent, who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, and to gather them for battle. In number, they are like the sand on the seashore. Uh, They marched across uh, the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them, and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet have been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. And they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And then let's skip down to verse 9 through 11. We see the new Jerusalem, where John has a vision of the new Jerusalem. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of seven last plagues came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride and the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God, and his brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. And then John goes on and describes the beauty of the city, the holy city, which is the new Jerusalem. 
And then we'll turn to uh, chapter 22. We'll read the first six verses. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, and down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, <clears throat> yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more light. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and uh, ever. And then we'll turn to verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come. And let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. I warn everyone who hears the words of the, of the prophecy of this scroll, if anyone adds anything to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in this scroll. And if anyone takes words away from this scroll of prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this scroll. He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. So far, reading from God's holy word. As I mentioned earlier, our text will be the, the last chapters of the book of Revelation, chapters 20 through 22. Seeing the large amount of material we're covering, we're not able to uh, cover every detail, and there's so much in these chapters which we're not able uh, to even really explore further. For example, there's so much imagery that goes back to the Old Testament, and yet we're not, we will not have time to look at all those different images. But the point then of going through the book of Revelation is to understand the framework so that we can have a better understanding of what all the details really stand for and how we are able to uh, put it all, to, all together, understand what the message Jesus really is given to his church. So, brothers and sisters of our Lord Jesus Christ, <clears throat> we are now dealing with, you say, the very last part, the last section of the book of Revelation. This is the, the seventh um, sermon. And we've kind of broken the book up into seven sections. And you notice the number seven is also a symbolical number that is used in Scripture and especially is important in the book of Revelation. In the previous sermons, uh, we have attempted to understand the big picture and so that we might understand the purpose of this book. So now that we've come to the end of the book of Revelation, the Lord Jesus describes for us the destruction of Satan, who is the great enemy. And it also reveals to us the great victory of the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. The church of Christ is victorious already today. And therefore, as believers, we can already look forward to the day when the Lord Jesus will return to judge the, the whole world. Because... Of his victory today, he will be victorious in his completeness and fullness at his return. And that day, we see that the new Jerusalem will appear in all of his glory. Paradise will again be restored in even greater splendor than it ever was in the beginning. And so the book closes with the words that are on the lips and have been on the lips of all believers throughout the ages. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. And so this morning we'll listen to God's word under this theme, the church is victorious in Jesus Christ. So the theme, the Lord, the church is victorious in Jesus Christ. Under that theme we'll look at four things. First of all, we'll see that the church is victorious. Secondly, we'll look at the day of judgment. Thirdly, that we will inherit this holy city of God. In the fourth place, that paradise will be restored. In the first, and then in the last place, we look at the words, come Lord Jesus. So as we begin reading in Genesis chapter, or in Revelation chapter 20, John sees a dragon 
This is the same dragon he already saw back in chapter 12. And this dragon is Satan. John also sees that an angel from heaven comes and binds up Satan for a thousand years, and then he throws him into the abyss, into the bottomless pit, where he's locked up and where he is, and where the pit is sealed. And then at the end of that thousand years, Satan is released, and then he goes out and he deceives the nations. As he goes out deceiving the nations, he now gathers the nations from the whole earth, referred to here by John as Gog and Magog for battle. So they go and they surround the camp of God's people. They surround the city that God loves. But as they surround the people of God, what happens? Suddenly John sees a fire came down from heaven and it devoured the enemies of the church. And so we see the great victory. Now, there are some challenges in interpreting this particular passage. Believers have uh, taken different positions on when this thousand-year reign of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, happens. The question is, will there be a thousand years reign at the end of this world when the Lord Jesus will then reign over the whole world for a thousand years? Or... Is a thousand years come at the end of this, this age, and then the church will reign perfectly over the world, and then Satan uh, will be let loose to, to attack the church, and then Christ will come back? Or does a thousand years represent the gospel era in which we are now living today? And at the end of this gospel era in which we are living, then Satan will be let loose for a period of time, to gather the nations in battle against the church of Jesus Christ. Now, in order to answer that question, we need to first look at the, the context of the book of Revelation. Remember as we've gone through the book that we have seen that each section of the book of Revelation looks at the events of the world from a different perspective. And so Revelation does not give us a timeline from the beginning of the book to the end of the book showing us the things that will happen progressively over time. But no, each section gives us an overview of the entire history of the world. But it's an overview that shows us what's going to happen from a different perspective. And so you may remember that at the end of chapter 19, there we're told about the battle of Armageddon. That battle that's going to happen at the very end of this world. And in that battle, the two beasts, the one beast who rose from the sea and the other beast who rose from the land, who is identified as the false prophet, is destroyed. And they're destroyed together with all those who, who follow them, with all the, the unbelievers in this world. And so when you finish reading that, then you would expect that in the next vision that John sees, that Jesus is going to show John what's going to happen on this earth from a different perspective. Because in chapter 19, the end has come. And so if John's going to see more happening, it must be then a different perspective of the same time period. Well, in chapter 19, John saw the two beasts who served the dragon being destroyed. And now here in chapter 20, what does John see? Now John sees the dragon, Satan himself, being destroyed. So in verse 8 of this chapter, chapter 20, John again sees the battle of Armageddon. The same battle in which the two beasts were destroyed and in which he now sees Satan is going to be destroyed. And so John or Jesus now focused on Satan. Why? Because Satan is the great enemy. Remember, Satan is the enemy who first came to Eve in the very beginning in the Garden of Eden. It is Satan who stands behind all the evil and all the wickedness that you find here in this world. Satan is promoting sin and wickedness in every possible way. And so the Lord Jesus shows John that Satan has lost some of his ability to, to deceive the world. And that Jesus himself, since his resurrection, is now exerting his power over this world. You see, the key to understanding this passage is in verse 3. We were told that Satan was thrown into the abyss, 
And then it says this. It says that he was kept from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years were ended. Now, first of all, keep in mind that in line with the use of numbers in the book of Revelation, numbers are symbolical. Numbers are not intended to be literal. So this number of thousands is not necessarily intended to be a literal thousand years. It could be a thousand years, but it's not the intent to tell us it's a thousand years. Since the number 10 in scriptures represents fullness or completeness, what we have here is 10 times 10 times 10, which equals a thousand, and it represents the completeness of time. And so a thousand represents a whole period of time. But the question is, what is that period of time to which the that 1,000 years is, is referring. Well, Lord Jesus leaves us some clues in the Gospels when he spoke to his disciples. There are two events that help us. First one is found in Luke chapter 10. Remember, Jesus sent out 72 of his disciples. He says, go to all the towns and the villages uh, in order that they might pr pr proclaim the Gospel. And then they return back to the Lord Jesus and uh, they return with joy because they say to the Lord Jesus, Jesus, even the demons submit to us in your name. And then the Lord Jesus replies in a very astonishing way. He replies and says, you know, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you, my disciples, authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome the power of the enemy. Nothing, nothing will harm you. So you see, when the gospel is being proclaimed throughout the land of Israel, what does it have? It has the power to overcome the demons. And why does, did they have the power to overcome the demons? Because Jesus says, I saw Satan thrown out of heaven. He was thrown out of, he was thrown from his throne there in heaven. He no longer has the authority that he used to have. There's another event in John chapter 12, just before his crucifixion. There, John tells us there are a number of Greek Gentile believers in Jerusalem who wanted to speak to the Lord Jesus. And in that context, the Lord Jesus says, now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world, referring to Satan, will be driven out. So you see, here they are these Greek believers, believers who come from the nations of the world. They come to the Lord Jesus here in Jerusalem. And what does Jesus do? Jesus says, this is a sign. This is a sign to me that Satan, as the prince of this world, is driven out. So what is Jesus telling us? He's saying that I'm about to bring in a new era. One in which Satan will no longer have control over the nations of the world like he had before. Think about the situation in the world in the days of the Lord Jesus. Now, before the Lord Jesus came to the world, all the nations of the world were deceived by Satan. All the nations of the world opposed God and they opposed the people of God there in Israel. Only there in Israel is God acknowledged in the whole world. Nobody else acknowledges God but the Jews. But Jesus says, but that's going to change because I have come. The nations will no longer be deceived in the same way. Satan will no longer be able to exercise full power over the nations of the world. Why? Because my gospel will go out and my gospel will now make inroads among all the peoples of the earth. Jesus is already saying here, he says, the church will grow, not only in Israel, but the church will grow throughout the whole world. Why? Because Satan will not have the power anymore to destroy the work that I am doing. And therefore, the thousand years, beloved, represents that gospel era in which we are living, in which the devil doesn't have that overwhelming power to deceive all mankind and deceive the whole world anymore. Right? Today we see it. The gospel is progressing uh, through the world. The church continues to exist. The church even continues to grow in many parts of the world today. The wonderful thing is that John also saw thrones in heaven. And seated on them are the souls of the believers who were martyred for their faith and who gave testimony about Jesus. 
See, when these believers died, John says, and I saw that they came to life in heaven. There he saw the souls of the believers. That means that these believers have won the victory over this life. And therefore, they now reign with the Lord Jesus today in heaven. Now, there's so much more to say about this passage. But what Jesus shows us is that as the church of Christ, as believers, beloved, we, don't, we do not need to fear the very power of Satan. Why? Because we have the Lord Jesus Christ and we have the gospel message on our side. Satan and his cronies, they will oppose the church. They will try to deceive us. But the gospel, Jesus says, has the power to open the eyes and to open the hearts of many. The church will prevail against the powers of darkness. So what we, and when you look at the history of this world, you'll see that there are indeed different periods in, in the history of different nations in different parts of the world where the devil seems to exert greater power, maybe lesser power. Today in our North American culture, we are seeing the forces of darkness indeed being marshaled against the church and against the people of God and against the very word of God. I think that we could say that God is giving our culture over uh, to the wickedness of their own hearts. Uh, Paul talks about it in Romans chapter 1. And yet there are other parts in the world today where the gospel continues to powerfully exert influence in the lives of many and the church continues to grow exponentially. But the Lord reveals that at the end of this gospel era, the devil will be given license by God to make one final push one exerted push against the church of God. And in that time, he will again, he will deceive the nations. And so the nations, they will gather together against the church, which is described as the camp of God's people. Think of the Old Testament people in, in, in the wilderness. This is the city that God loves, the Jerusalem. And so there will be times, beloved, when, when God's people, and we as God's people, we may feel desperate and we may feel that we are about to be defeated uh, by the powers of wickedness around us. But just when we may feel as if that's the end, as if we're making that final stand and, and we can no longer exist, it's just then that Christ comes. Christ will appear then at that battle of Armageddon that will appear at the end. And when he appears, what happens? Fire comes down and fire destroys Satan and his cronies. And he will be thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where also the beasts and the false prophet have been thrown. And there he will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Christ, beloved, will win the battle. We as the church we will be victorious in Christ Jesus. Well, next, Christ, John sees Christ coming in judgment. He describes that coming as Jesus uh, seated on the white throne. And as he sees that white throne in this vision, and he says, the dead, great and small, that he saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. So what John sees here is he sees this great resurrection. A great resurrection in which all of mankind rise from the dead and they stand here before the great white throne judgment. Each person has a book, a book that has recorded everything that they have thought, everything they have said, everything they have done. And we're told that they will be judged according to what is recorded in the books. There's also another book that is open. It's a single book, one book. It's called the Book of Life, and it contains the names of all of God's people who will be saved. A book that was already written before the foundations of the world. No one, we're told, no one will be spared from this judgment. Right, the sea. The sea gave up the dead in it. We think of all those bodies that have been buried in the sea, in the bottom of the sea. They will all be raised up. Death and Hades. Hades referring to the place of the dead or even the grave. They will give up the dead in it. That means all of mankind, every single person who ever lived here on this earth will 
hearts rise up and they will stand before the judgment of God. Now, it's interesting that Christians often have questions and wonder about this judgment that we find described here. For John sees that the believers are already seated at the, on the throne when they die, and then their souls go to be uh, on the thrones with Christ there in heaven. And so the question that I'm often asked uh, in my pastoral visits is, well, how can we be judged again? if we already are in heaven when we die. And the answer, beloved, is that in the last day, all mankind will arise with their human bodies, and our souls will again be reunited with our body, and there we will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ in our raised bodies. And then those who are unbelieving, they will be punished, John says, according to what they have done. It will be clear from what's written in the books that they deserve the eternal punishment of God because of their rebellious attitude against the Lord. For the believers, for all those who are in Christ, yes, the books will then also be open, but our works do not prove that we deserve to be saved. But our works reveal that we have lived our life by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember what James said about faith. He says, faith without works is dead. And therefore, the Lord does not look to see if, if somehow we have earned our salvation by our good works. But what is God looking for? God is looking to see if we have lived a life of faith. Right? It is by our works that it will become clear whether we have lived by faith or not. And so the Lord Jesus does not look to see if, if we have been perfect because he will not find any one of us there as being perfect. But when he looks in the books, he looks to see if we have been faithful, faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. Because a new life in Christ, beloved, will always reveal itself in a completely new life, a life in which you faithfully serve the Lord your God. And yes, with all our weaknesses, but nevertheless, we, we still faithfully we hold on to our Lord, we cling to our Lord, and we serve our Lord with our whole heart. And then, then John sees that death and Hades, the place of the dead, is thrown into the lake of fire. That means that death and Hades will no longer exist. Our new life will never again be touched with death. We will have now eternal life. And the lake of fire, John says, is the second death. And everyone whose name is not found in the book of life will be thrown into that lake of fire. You see, the second death will only touch those who have rebelled against the Lord God and refused to repent. They rose up in the resurrection, and they will be cast into eternal hell where they will experience torment forever and ever. But beloved, when we rise up in Christ, when we live in Christ each day again, we look to him for our life and for our salvation, then that second death, that will affect the unbelievers, will not touch us, for we will live forever with the Lord our God. And then John finally says that we will, shows us that we will inherit the city of God, all those who have been raised up in Christ Jesus. Chapter 21, verse 1, John saw a new heaven and a new earth, for he says the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Remember verse 11, he saw that the heavens and the earth, they, they fled from the presence of Christ when Christ came back from heaven. John also saw that there is no longer any sea here on the earth. Remember that the sea represents the nations, the, the heathen, wicked nations of the world. <clears throat> so they're all gone. Now when you first read these words, I think we often get the impression and people often also think that Jesus is, says he's going to make something completely new. He's going to make something completely different than what we have here in his creation. But notice what verse 5 says. There, in verse 5, we see that the one on the throne says, I am making everything new. I am making everything new. Notice he does not say, I will make new things. But he says, I will make everything new. It's like 
You know, somebody who has an old car. It's kind of beat up. It doesn't work too well. And he says, I will make it new. He doesn't mean that he's going to scrap the car and he's going to now completely start new, making something completely new. No, what he says is, I'm going to renew the old car. I will make it new. And so it may mean that he needs a new paint job. It may mean that he needs to replace some of, some of the parts, but it's going to be restored again. And that is what the Lord also will do with this earth. An earth that has been defiled by sin. He will restore the whole earth so that it will again have that new splendor like it has never had ever before. In this world that is renewed by the Lord Jesus, John now saw a holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride as beautifully dressed for her husband. So the holy city, the new Jerusalem, represents the church, represents the bride of Christ, which is us as his church, as his believers. This is where we will live, beloved, as God's people in the future. Verse 21, verse 3 tells us that God will live in this city and he will be among his people. You know, and you hear these beautiful words, words that actually are repeated by God throughout the entire scriptures. Time and again, you'll read it through scriptures as God addresses his people throughout history. He says, they will be my people and I, my, and I myself will be with them. And I will be their God. Well, beloved, that's what God has said all along. I will again restore my relationship with my people. You'll be my people. I will be your God. And finally, finally here with the new Jerusalem, that relationship between God and us, that relationship is now completely, it's fully restored. What we long for. We long to be able to live in that holy presence of God. That will now become a reality here in the holy city. To live with God, beloved, will be the most wonderful thing that we'll ever, ever experience. In fact, John says, he will wipe away every tear from our eyes. There'll be no more death. Imagine, no more death announcements like we heard this morning. There'll be no mourning. There'll be no crying. There'll be no pain. The old order with all of its troubles will pass away. John writes, these words, notice, beloved, these words are trustworthy and they are true. Jesus says, I guarantee this will happen. New heavens, the new earth will come, the new Jerusalem will come. I will live with you and I will take away the pain and the struggles and the, str and the, struggles and the pain in your life. And then John is carried away in the spirit to a mountain that's great and high. And there from the mountain, John saw the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. And then follows, and we weren't able to read that whole section, but then follows a wonderful description of this beautiful city. We read that the city, it shone with the glory of God. Its brilliance was like that of precious jewels. Imagine a wall of diamonds with the light glittering off of it. And as you look at the description, let's keep this in mind. Keep in mind that this is not a literal description of what the new Jerusalem is going to look like. But God uses this description because he wants to try to give to us a sense of how beautiful this new life is going to be like. He's using human terms to try to reveal to us something of the glory that we can never fully comprehend. And neither should we think about the city with great walls because really Jerusalem doesn't need walls. But the reason that we're told about these walls in this vision is to reveal to us that multitudes will live here on the new earth. The multitudes of God's people will fill this city and the streets. The streets will not necessarily be paved with real gold, but, but the point is that the riches and the beauty of this new life will be beyond anything that we can even imagine. Imagine roads paved with gold, unimaginable from our human perspective. Now again, I'm not able to go through every detail, but I just want to focus on a few key points about this description. One of the key features of the city is that it is a cube, a cube. That means it is as wide as it is high as it is long. 
And each dimension, its width, its length, and its height is 12,000 stadia. Stadia is a form of measurement. Uh, now, immediately a, a student of the, of the scriptures, of the Bible, will remember that in the temple, the most holy place was also a cube. And it measured 20 cubits in every direction. Remember that the most holy place is the place where the ark was placed. The ark was the throne of God. So this is the place where we're God who dwelled in among his people Israel. And so the most holy place that was just 20 cubits wide uh, there in the temple, we're told now will expand. And it expanded to include the whole city where God's people live. John later in verse 22 says that he did not see a temple in the city. Why? Because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. What it means is that God no longer needed a, needs a temple to, to live in. Because the whole city, the new Jerusalem, has become the temple. Right? That uh, the most holy place has now encompassed the whole city of Jerusalem. And when you look at the numbers that are used there, again, they have symbolical meaning. That's why you cannot translate uh, these numbers into modern measurements. For example, 12,000 stadia in a modern measurement would be equal to 2,200 kilometers. But the point here is that the number 12,000 represents the complete, the perfect work of God in his church. We know that three is the number for the triune God. Four represents uh, the earth, the four corners of the earth. And then ten times ten ten ti times ten represents perfection or completeness. And so that number 12,000 means that this city is absolutely perfect. And so as the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have now been made perfect. It means that we are now able to live in the holy presence of our God forever. Its walls are 144 cubits thick, literally about 200 feet wide. But what's important here is the number 144, th four, because we've come across that number earlier in Revelation, where it describes where the 144 is a description for the entire church, from the Old and the New Testament. So it, re so it represents all the believers from over the, from over the whole earth. And therefore, the whole church Everyone who is saved by Christ will live in this city. Not a single person will be left out. And that becomes, that becomes even more pointed when you realize that the 12 gates have the, 12, have the names of the 12 tribes of Israel on them and that the, 12, and that the walls have 12 foundations and that the name of the 12 apostles are written on them. So the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 apostles... They represent the Old and the New Testament church, and they're all gathered together here in the holy city of God. John says, I also saw that the city did not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is, and the lamb is its lamp. And again here, keep in mind we're dealing with symbolical language. We do not need to conclude uh, that God will get rid of the sun and the moon. It's possible, but that's not really the point that's being made here. The point is that as we need the light of the sun and we need the light of the moon in order to direct us as we walk here on this earth, and so in the holy city, God will direct our life and it is the Lamb who will be the lamp who shines, us for, who shines for us the way in which we are to go. I think we all know that in this life, we're, we're often walking in the darkness. And we walk in the darkness whenever we are following the evil desires here in our own heart. But in this new life, there in the holy city, we will always walk in the light of God. We will never, ever stumble. Imagine that. We'll never stumble. Never fall into sin. But never again transgress the holy will of our God. We will always walk in the ways of our Lord as, as we're constantly being guided by his, by his light and by His lamp. Never, John says, will anything impure enter into the city, 
nor anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful will ever enter into the city. No one who has walked in the way of sin will enter into the holy city of God. That means, beloved, only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life will enter into this city. There is no other way into this glorious city. The only way through, the only way into the city, beloved, is through the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who comes and who washes us clean with his shed blood on the cross. And then finally what John sees in the city is the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb right down the middle of the great street of the city. And on each side of that river there stood the tree of life. Remember in the first paradise there was only one tree. Here, there are trees on both sides of the river. And the trees, John says, they bear 12 crops of fruit, yielding fruit every month. And leaves of the trees, he says, are for the healing of the nations. And so again, this image reminds us that in the holy city, God is going to be the source for our life. Right, that life-giving water, where does it flow from? It flows from the very throne of God, not by the throne, but from the throne. That water causes the trees of life to produce an abundance of fruit that will nourish God's people here in this city forever. Remember in the beginning in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, they could eat from the fruit of all the trees in the garden. Only... Only they could not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So there in the garden, their God provided Adam and Eve with everything. All the food that they would ever need, that they would ever desire. But we know that all of that changed when Adam and Eve fell into sin. God's curse came on this earth. And the result, God says to man, is that you will eat only by the sweat of your brow. But here in the new Jerusalem... Paradise will again be restored, although in even greater glory. It's striking that, that John does not see in this, par in this new paradise the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Right in this paradise restored, <clears throat> there's no longer a forbidden tree. But we may eat freely from every single tree throughout the entire paradise. The curse of God is removed so that we will never ever lack anything. God will fulfill all every need, even provide us with every desire that we have. Imagine that, beloved. Every desire that you have will be fulfilled. Why? Because our desires will always be good. Our desires will always be perfect, and therefore God will always fulfill them. Paradise will again be restored, and we will rejoice with all of God's people there in the holy city of our God. And that's why we will cry out with all of God's people, Come! Come, Lord Jesus! Right, the Lord Jesus says in, verse, in chapter 22, 7, he says, Look, look, I am coming. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy written in this scroll, or here, you can say, in this book. Jesus also gives a warning, verses 18 and 19. He says, If anyone adds to these words of mine, God will add to that person the plagues in the scroll. And if anyone takes away from the scroll, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life and in the holy city. Remember, beloved, the Lord Jesus, why does he speak to us in this book? Why did he give us the book of Revelation? Because he wants to encourage us. But at the same time, he also warns us. He says, if you reject what I have told you, or if you add anything to what I have told you, and you make a new gospel, or you make a new teaching, then you will have no part in the kingdom of God. You will have no share, he says, in the tree of life and in the holy city. Beloved, what a blessing. What a blessing to be able to take the words of our Lord Jesus, to take them seriously, to reflect on them and to live according to them. What a blessing to look to the Lord Jesus as my Lord, the one who now reigns there in heaven. 
He is leading all things in this world, and he's leading everything in my life to that glorious day when the holy city, the new Jerusalem, will come down from heaven. How we are ready today, beloved, may long for that day as we now have a glimpse of that day that is given to us here in the book of Revelation. We see its glory. We then also desire for that day to come quickly. In Christ, we know that we are victorious. And in Christ, beloved, we now await that glorious life in the city of our God. And so Jesus testifies. He says to us, yes, beloved, I am coming soon. And we respond, amen. Come, Lord Jesus.